The World Health Organization says almost 15 million people across the globe have lost their lives as a result of COVID-19 over the past two years. Wall Street lost ground on Thursday, surrendering gains secured a day earlier as traders responded to the Federal Reserve's latest weight hike. Hello and welcome to The Daily Report. It's Friday afternoon, May 6th here in Korea. I'm Min Sun Hee. Now, ahead of his trip to South Korea later this month, U.S. President Joe Biden's office says Mr. Biden is poised to reaffirm his commitment to security and stability here in this part of the world in the wake of Pyongyang's blatant acts of provocation. Our Kim Dami has this top story. U.S. President Joe Biden will reaffirm Washington's commitment to the defense of South Korea and Japan during a visit to the two countries later this month. White House spokesperson Jen Psaki said in a briefing on Thursday that U.S. commitments, including on extended deterrence, remain ironclad. Biden will sit down for talks with the leaders of South Korea and Japan to discuss their common challenges and tasks, among them strengthening security alliances and coping with the pandemic. Pointing out Pyongyang's continuous activities have caused instability in the region, Saki added North Korea issues will also be on the agenda. In fact, U.S. Defense Chief Lloyd Austin reaffirmed U.S. commitment to defending Seoul using the full range of U.S. military capabilities, including extended deterrence. During Austin's phone call with South Korea's Defense Minister Hulk on Thursday, the two sides reviewed the North's recent flurry of missile activity and vowed to closely cooperate to enhance their combined defense posture. Also on Thursday, the U.S. Senate unanimously approved the nomination of Philip Goldberg as the new ambassador to South Korea. He is expected to be officially appointed by President Joe Biden soon and kick off his career in Seoul with Biden's upcoming visit to South Korea. Goldberg, a Korea ambassador, is currently serving as ambassador to Colombia and also served as a coordinator for implementation of the UN Security Council resolution on North Korea during the Obama administration. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Meanwhile, President-elect Yoon Seok-yeol's transition committee is concluding its 50-day campaign of laying the groundwork for the incoming administration. The disbanding ceremony is set for 5 p.m. Korea time at the committee's headquarters in central Seoul, where the chairman An Chol Su will share related remarks. The committee was launched eight days following the March 9th presidential election, and earlier this week, it unveiled 110 national tasks to be tackled by the Yoon administration, which takes office next Tuesday. Russia's Vladimir Putin has reportedly reiterated commitment to humanitarian corridors for civilian evacuation from the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. Now, this is according to Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett following talks over the phone with the Russian leader. Our Kim Yuzan now has the remarks from Kremlin. Russia says it is still ready to provide safe evacuation for civilians from the Azovstal steel works in the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. According to the Kremlin, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett held a phone call Thursday to exchange their views on the situation in Ukraine. Putin explained that Ukraine should order the troops defending the steel plant to lay down their arms. Scores of Ukrainian civilians, including women and children, remain trapped in underground bunkers at the steel facility. This comes as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said he has spoken to the chief of the United Nations to discuss evacuating Ukrainians from Mariupol. I spoke today with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres on what has already been accomplished, about what else we can do to protect the people of Mariupol and the defenders of the city. There was not a single day that I was not working on it, that we were not working on it, and I'm grateful to everyone who helps. He further explained that 344 civilians were evacuated from the city on Thursday. Meanwhile, the UN chief told the UN Security Council Thursday that a third operation is underway to help evacuate civilians from Mariupol. He declined to provide details on the new operation to avoid undermining possible success. Against his backdrop, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson discussed the possibility of supplying longer-range weaponry to Ukraine with his Ukrainian counterpart. In a call on Thursday, the two leaders discussed developments on the battlefield as well as the needs of Ukraine's armed forces. Kim Yusan, Arirang News. In other news, Wall Street lost ground on Thursday, surrendering gains secured a day earlier as traders responded to the Fed's half-point rate hike. Armin Sukhan reports. 
U.S. stocks pulled back sharply on Thursday following the Federal Reserve's move to curb the country's worst inflation in 40 years. Major Wall Street benchmarks ended lower, erasing most of the gains made from the previous session. The tech-heavy Nasdaq dipped almost 5% to finish at 12,317, its worst daily percentage fall since June 2020 and also its lowest closing level since November 2020. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped more than 3%, posting its worst daily performance since October 2020. Thursday's broad sell-off comes as investors fret over bigger rate hikes in the next couple of months after the U.S. Federal Reserve raised its benchmark interest rate by half a percentage point. The market is in an enormous amount of uncertainty, and uncertainty is one of the biggest killers of any market. And so the fact that we are uncertain about what inflation is going to do, uh, what the Fed is going to do in reaction to inflation, and then ultimately how that impacts uh, global growth is, is what's really driving markets down today. During a press conference, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell explicitly ruled out a 75 basis point rate hike, but said he was looking at additional 50 basis point increases to rein in inflation. Inflation is much too high, and we understand the hardship it is causing, and we're moving expeditiously to bring it back down. We have both the tools we need and the resolve that it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. It was not only stocks that suffered following the Federal Reserve's announcement. Traders headed for the exits in cryptocurrency markets as well, with Bitcoin prices dipping to 36900 on Thursday, erasing Wednesday's 6% gain. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. OPEC Plus has decided to maintain its modest supplies to the oil market. In a statement after the group's teleconference on Thursday, members said they would add 432,000 barrels a day in June. The decision comes despite demands from the West for a significant boost in production, with group members claiming they cannot be blamed for supply disruptions in Russian oil. They also said future demand looks uncertain amid China's COVID-19 lockdowns. A security accord signed between the Solomon Islands and China back in April is raising fresh alarm over Beijing's growing influence, with Australia claiming the deal has the potential to undermine regional stability. For more on this, I have Adam Hancock live on the line. Adam, welcome. Good afternoon. Right, now Australia has been a traditional ally of the Solomon Islands and it has made no secret about its concerns with regard to the security pact between China and the Pacific Island country. Let's begin with a few words on these concerns, Adam. Well, I think the, the main concern for Australia is the possibility that China might build some kind of military base or increase their military presence in the Solomon Islands. Remember, this is a country that's about 1,600 kilometres away from Australia. And given the worsening tensions at the moment between Australia and China, Australia are very concerned about China, you know, being so close with a potential military base. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, he described it as a red line. He said if China were to, to build a base there. And that gives an indication of the worries and the concerns here. Now, if you take a look at the draft um, that was leaked of the security pact between the Solomon Islands and China, it shows quite clearly that there's the possibility that China could deploy some kind of naval or strategic units to the Solomon Islands, even armed personnel or police um, to kind of quash any social unrest in Solomon. So there's definitely reasons for concern. And also this is a part of the world where Australia has had a very good relationship with the Pacific Island nations for a long time. Things have been fairly settled suddenly China is coming in and that's going to rock the boat a little bit. It's going to disrupt things a little bit and it's going to increase the risk for not only Australia but also New Zealand as well and their other allies in the region. So overall it's it's a part of the world that Australia feels like they've had some kind of control over almost and a really strong relationship with and suddenly China has kind of come out of nowhere, signed this deal and there's possibility of you know them increasing their presence in the region. Right, Adam. Now, like you said, this particular concern is shared by Australia, the US and, of course, their allies. Uh, the security pact, they believe, may allow China, like you mentioned, a strategic military foothold in the South Pacific. But how are pundits over there in Australia weighing the prospect of this particular scenario? 
Well, I think a lot of pundits here see this as a genuine risk. Again, if I refer to that leaked draft document, um, some of the terms of that, it's very open-ended at the moment. We don't know exactly the terms of this deal, and I think that is what is worrying people because it's a little bit unknown. There's a, there's a lot to, to be found, to discovered at the moment. Um, people are concerned of, of what it might entail. On the flip side of the coin, some people are saying we should take it for face value and listen to what the Solomon Islands is telling us. They are saying there's not going to be a base. They're saying this is purely for an internal security arrangement. And there is lots of secure, internal security needed in the Solomon Islands. We have a lot of, we've seen a lot of unrest there, some protests, some rioting. It was uh, only back in November when Australia actually sent some personnel over um, to deal with some recent unrest. And both, both sides at the moment, China and Solomon Islands, they've denied that this, there's anything more to this and that they're trying to build a base or anything. But I think overall, most people do have a lot of concern about it. We know for a while now, China has been signing some economic deals with Pacific Island nations, and they've certainly been eyeing up that part of the world. And I think people are looking upon this a little bit wary at the moment. Right. Adam, Prime Minister Manessa Sagaver of the Solomon Islands has taken issue with the word backyard used by Australian uh, Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews in referring to the islands. Now, speaking within your capacity as a journalist, do you see this particular word as a harmless metaphor, something more? I would probably look at it more towards being a bit of a harmless metaphor. It's probably a little bit of a, a throwaway comment. Um, language in Australia can from time to time be quite casual, even within Australian politics. And effectively referring to something as being in your backyard is, is basically just referring it to something being quite close by. I don't think it's meant in too much of a derogatory manner. Although clearly it has caused a lot of upset in the Solomon Islands. The Prime Minister, as you mentioned, he went on a bit of a, a, a tirade about it in Parliament the other day, saying a backyard is somewhere where you put your rubbish. We should be treated with more respect. We're an independent nation. We have a vote at the United Nations. We should be treated equally. And also it's all part of a wider kind of feel that Australia has started to take their eye off the ball a bit when it comes to Solomon and the other Pacific nations. They reduced some federal aid. Um, there was a lot of um, upset that Australia didn't send more senior ministers uh, to the Solomon Islands when word of this security pact with China first came about. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism from the opposition Labour Party here about the way the government has, has handled this. So using terms like backyard, it probably does look a bit um, unprofessional, certainly a little bit disrespectful. But from a personal opinion, I would say knowing you know Australian culture and uh, the Australian use of language, it's probably a little bit more harmless, but maybe maybe lost in translation slightly. Right. And staying with language, um, Adam, this is an impromptu question, but there's also been talk about how the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands talked to, spoke, spoke about that, is of a potential invasion of the country. How are authorities over there in Australia responding to this? Yes, yes, that, that came out the other day and uh, Scott Morrison actually released a, a statement or gave a press conference off the back of that. And I think he was trying to just slightly calm things down. I mean, it was Scott Morrison, after all, who first of all came out with this comment of a, a Chinese base in Solomon would be crossing a red line. Uh, he was then asked by a journalist what exactly would happen if China was to cross a red line. And he didn't really have an answer. Um, but it was sort of given the indication that there could be some kind of you know military force sent over. Um, no suggestion at all that that's going to happen. Um, but I think at, given the, the anger from the Solomon Prime Minister the other day, Scott Morrison has come out and he's tried to improve relations. He sort of said how they'll, they'll deal with this issue diplomatically. They'll continue to have good conversations. He's referred to a lot of uh, previous, um, you know, good moments between the two countries, including the aid that Australia has provided to the Solomon Islands, support with COVID-19 vaccinations. And he's tried to go go back on that a bit and, and, and just simmer things down a bit because it really did um, have the prospect of boiling over. And remember, we are in the middle of a general election campaign here. The last thing that Prime Minister Scott Morrison wants to do is to be dragged into a row over the Solomon Islands. Right, and I will get into that in a bit. But first, Adam, some observers believe that this security arrangement may have far-reaching global repercussions as the region hosts important shipping lanes. Do you care to elaborate? Sure, yes. Well, Solomon Islands are based in the middle of a very strategically important area of the world. It's a shipping lanes that connect the USA and their allies in Asia, as well as Australia and New Zealand. And China knows full well that if they were to get some kind of stronghold in the Solomon Islands, they could possibly, you know, block or disrupt 
those shipping lanes, which are very sought after um, and, and a, a very important way for Australia to communicate with the Pacific and also for trade and shipping uh, to come between the US and Asia. So the, it's a key part of the world and there's a much wider global context. This isn't just about the Solomon Islands. It's about China's possibility of, of taking more control in this part of the world. And yet again, in another part of the world, gaining more of a firmer grip um, and a, you know, a firmer base and that is something that's causing a lot of concern. It could also cause isolation for Australia as well. If, if China is to gain some control over these waters, then again, it kind of isolates Australia a little bit further and, and causes a bit more angst. I mean, these shipping routes, they've, they've long been sought after. You go back as far as World War II, uh, when Japan were trying to get control of the Solomon Islands, so they, they could get control of these shipping lanes. So this is nothing new. This part of the world has, has seen a, a lot of things like this in the past. Um, but it's very, very important at the moment what's happening in a, in a wider global context. Right. And now, Adam, going back to the domestic front over there in Australia, like you mentioned, this latest regional diplomatic development is becoming an issue ahead of the country's May 21st national elections. Having said that, what has been the general public response? Well, I think it has actually been a little bit of concern about this. People are well aware of this story. It's, it's led the news here for a couple of weeks now. Um, everybody is aware of the ongoing um, sort of dispute between China and Australia. Scott Morrison has obviously been very vocal about China, so people know about it. The um, Sydney Morning Herald newspaper, they actually ran a poll where 72% of the people polled said that they were concerned about this news of this security pact. So it's something that's cutting through. It's you know, it's making noise. Whether or not it's going to influence the election, that remains hard to hard to hard to call at the moment. Really, I mean, obviously the opposition Labour Party they're trying to make a big deal out of this. They're trying to use it as a stick to beat the government with. They they said it. They've dropped the ball. They've made a huge political blunder in allowing this deal to go ahead. Uh, but whether it's going to actually cut through with voters, it's hard to call. There's plenty of other things at the moment in focus here. Obviously, the economy, we saw interest rates being raised this week here. We're coming out of the back of a pandemic. There's lots of discussion how that has been handled uh, day to day, the cost of living crisis as well. So it's, as always in, in Australian elections, the, the focus is mainly on domestic issues. But for, for the first time in a long while in an election campaign, a, a foreign affairs issue ha has become a lot bigger. And of course, as I, as I mentioned earlier, this is, of course, bigger than just the Solomon Islands. This is about China and China's grip on this part of the world. And, and that's something that, that is something, sorry, that, that does concern Australians. Right. All right, Adam, thank you very much for making the time to join us live with your uh, thoughts. Thank you very much. On the local front, President Moon Jae-in has accepted the resignation of Prosecutor General Kim Osu, who tendered his resignation last month to protest legislation targeting prosecution reform. Now, this was Kim's second resignation request, as his first request was earlier rejected by President Moon. According to his spokesperson on Friday, President Moon is said to have turned down similar resignation requests by executive-level prosecutors to minimize vacancies in prosecution services. Last month, they collectively handed in their letters of resignation. Earlier this week, President Moon formally declared into law a pair of controversial bills passed by the ruling Democratic Party aimed at limiting the prosecution's power to investigate. Korea's COVID-19 tally has retreated to the 20,000 level, that is, on this Friday. Authorities have announced 26,714 new infections today, with some pundits linking the decline to fewer tests on Thursday in light of the Children's Day holiday. Meanwhile, 48 people lost their lives to COVID-19, while 423 remain in critical condition. There is strong belief that the downward trend will continue, with some health experts claiming the daily tally may further decline to below 10,000 a week from now. The global health body says close to 15 million losses of lives over the past two years are linked to COVID-19 and most are centered in Southeast Asia, Europe and the Americas. Our Om Jiang has more on this grim portrait. Nearly 15 million deaths around the world associated with COVID-19. This is according to the World Health Organization's estimate released on Thursday that about 14.9 million people died as a direct or indirect result of the virus between January 2020 and December 2021. 
considering the world population of roughly 7.9 billion, around one out of every 500 people died globally. So this estimate ranges from 13.3 million to 16.6 million. There were 5.4 million reported COVID-19 deaths uh, to WHO over this period. So this excess estimate represents nine and a half million more deaths or 2.75 times more deaths than reported. The head of the WHO, Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, described the figure as sovereign, adding the figure shows countries the need to invest more in their ability to be flexible when dealing with health emergencies. The WHO said middle-income countries accounted for over 80 percent of the estimated debts. 82 percent of the debts were in people 60 and over. 57 percent were men and 43 percent women. It added about 84 percent of the debts were concentrated in Southeast Asia, Europe and the Americas. According to the WHO's weekly COVID-19 tally report from April 25th to May 1st, the number of new infections stood at around 3.9 million, down 17 percent on week. However, the figure increased by 31 percent in Africa and by 13 percent in the Americas due to variants. The U.S. on Wednesday also surpassed the grim milestone of one million COVID-related deaths. Om ji Arirang News. On the local corporate front, South Korean tech giants have secured fresh recognition from the U.S. government for their contributions to protecting the environment through their energy-efficient products. Now, Samsung Electronics on Friday said it had received two Energy Star Partner of the Year awards for this year from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of, and the Department of Energy, that is. Also, for the ninth year, Samsung has been granted the Sustained Excellence Award for Product Brand Owner. In 2021, Samsung had 380 energy star based models in the US that are highly energy efficient. LG Electronics meanwhile was also named an honoree of the 2022 Energy Star Partner of the Year. Last year, LG's energy star based models created an effect equivalent to cancelling out the carbon dioxide emitted by nearly 78,000 cars in a year. Korea's southern resort island of Jeju is facing a fresh challenge amid the surge in travelers to the region, the task of tackling trash from tarnishing tourist sites. Arirang's Kim Yansen reports from the island. With masks off and group tours back on, more tourists are expected to flock to Jeju Island to enjoy this crisp beach breeze and this glistening blue sea. But while they'll be taking away treasured memories, they'll also be leaving behind heaps of trash. Jeju Island's local government estimates that more than 40 percent of daily waste is made up of trash discarded by tourists. Their research shows that there were more than 1,150 tons of trash a day in March last year. The amount of trash has increased by more than 15 tons per day compared to the year before. This makes sense considering the number of tourists also spiked that season with a steep 85.8 percent on-year increase. When COVID-19 first broke out and there was a steep decline in the number of tourists, we saw less daily trash. Also, it's true that trash thrown away by tourists is not sorted and recycled properly. The burden caused by this waste may increase, with Jeju Island expecting another wave of tourists this year. Naver, a popular search tool in South Korea, saw Jeju Island-related search terms like Jeju Island plane tickets, Jeju tours and Jeju hotels climb in recent months, hinting at growing interest in Jeju tourism. Jeju-related Google searches also showed a spike over the past year. If visitors properly sort their trash when they come, it would help a lot. If we burn less trash, there will be less carbon. On Jeju Island, there are two places where you can sort your trash, at a so-called clean house and at recycling help centres. Clean houses are ordinary recycling bins for pedestrians and there are about 1,500 of them sprawled across the island. But instead of these bins, Jeju Island is working on increasing the number of recycling help centers, where visitors can easily sort trash with the assistance of one of the center's helpers. 
If the visitors bring in trash like a plastic bottle, I weigh the trash and help them sort it in the right bins. If there's nobody here, people just throw away trash any way they like. These centers are located close to popular tourist spots. So when tourists visit the island, they can look for one and leave their trail as crisp and clean as they found it. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News, Jeju Island. On Viewpoint today, we have a journalist from Radio Free Asia whose story about two North Korean female defectors recently granted her a special award. Now, for more on her report and related recognition, I have Chun Soram here in the studio. It's a pleasure to have you here, Soram, and congratulations on winning this year's Gracie Award. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me here. Right. Soram, let's, for the sake of our viewers here then, let's start with a few words mm -hmm. on the Gracie Awards itself and on the Alliance for Women in Media Foundation that hosts this annual event. Event. Sure. Um, so the Gracia Awards is established in 1975 and it marks 70, 47th anniversary this year. And the Gracia Awards are mainly for women in media. Also, they recognize extraordinary program created by women, for women and about women um, who are making positive change in the media. I see. What about the foundation itself, the Alliance for Women in Media Foundation? What is the purpose of that particular foundation? Um, they try to highlight women's work in the media. Yeah, I, I feel see. like they that's the main reason right. for the award. So now among the winners for this year, aside from yourself, of mm. course, we have Melissa McCarthy and Kelly Clarkson, just to name a few. How do you feel? It felt really unreal at first, and it's been only one and a half years since I started working with RFA. Um, so I was not expecting to win the Grace Awards, to be honest. Um, and yeah, it would have been really impossible without unconditional help from my editor, director, and my coworker. Um, so. I just can't forget the moment I figured out about the Gracia Award. Um, it was just one day I just woke up in the morning and because I work with the DC team and there's time difference, so my morning written is checking my work email. So I was, I was checking email and then there are tons of emails from my coworkers, director, editor, and it was about Gracia Award. So I was like, my heart was really beating Best. Right, I'm sure. Congratulations again, of course. Now, Soram, this may be a tough question, but what do you believe was the reason behind this particular recognition for your report by the foundation? Um, the report itself is by Uman, me, and my co-worker, Jung Min No, and it's for Uman, and it's about Uman. Um, so it's for Uman and everyone who might not have enough information about North Korean society. And this gives a unique chance to picture how it's like to live as a woman in North Korea. And it's about women. It shows the journey of two North Korean female defectors in their early 20s, Kim and Lee. And it has testimony from various age groups from their 20s and 50s. And it depicts the changes of North Korean women's perspective over time in a heavily male-dominated society and how they seek changes to become an independent woman. And we also have Lindsay Miller, oh, she's from UK and she lived in Pyongyang for two years. Um, so getting outsiders' view is extremely difficult these days. Um, so by having her in our report, I feel like we have insider's view and outsider's view, which allowed us to have more colorful story for the report. I see, and I will ask you about your interview with Lindsay, uh, Lindsay yeah. Miller in a little while, but first let's go back to your actual coverage then. So mm -hmm. you covered the escape from North Korea into South Korea by two North Korean defectors, female defectors mm -hmm. that is. How did you first meet them and what were your initial thoughts about them during your first encounter? Um, so I did this story with reporter Jung Min No, and he in 2019, um, he met the two of the defectors 
um, who just crossed the Mekong River and who just escaped from North Korea. Um, so he followed the defection journey and he met like 13, 13 people of North Korean defectors and the two of them were among the 13. Um, so that's how we first met, not me, but him, how he first met them. And that's the starting point of our project for this one. And for me, I met them last year in September, I guess. And like the first initial encounter, um, my impression was just two young, two young Korean women in their early 20s. Um, but then after I have a conversation with them, after I interviewed them about what they went through, about the fiction journey, I just couldn't believe what they went through. Um, so after the conversation in interview, I see them as two young, brave, independent women in South Korea. Right, I'm sure they're bravery, of course. The title of your report, Soram, it translated into English literally, is Rerouting, Define the Given Path and Paving a New One, which I understand is essentially what these two female North Korean True. defectors were seeking to do. Tell us a bit about the given path for North Korean women and the new path that they seek to pave. Mm -hmm. So the given path, um, in North Korea, it's heavily male-dominated society. Um, they face severe gender inequality in their daily lives. Um, they feel pressure to get married, have children, and have family before a certain age. Um, and getting married, it's not an option for them. It's a must. They have to get married. Um, it's a matter of survival. That's what I heard. Um, for like paving the new one in South Korea. Um, so they want to become independent women. That's why they came to South Korea. Um, so the two North Korean defectors, Kim and Lee, um, Kim is studying to become an accountant and Lee is studying nursing, um, chasing her dream of working in a medical field. Um, they knew that the gender equality inequality is a, also a problem in South Korea. Um, but what they have achieved since they got to South Korea would have been impossible in, the, in North Korea. Um, so they are taking their first step to become independent women. Right, well, that is great to know. So I'm going back to your report. Simply speaking then, your coverage touch, touches upon the universal plight perhaps faced by women living in oppressed societies. Mm -hmm. But with regard to the North Korean women, I understand aside from being required to be caregivers and housekeepers, they're also required to be breadwinners. Could you tell us a bit about that? Um, so typically when they get married, they have to do housework, raise kids, and they have to also work because their standard of living is not really good enough just for one person like their husband working. Um, but then based on the interview, North Korean women's perspective are changing these days. Among young women, um, they want to focus more about their career and they they are they like eager to have their own jobs, but they are still being forced to get married, but they are not, not rushing. So they are slowly changing, the perspectives are changing, but there are still old generation who, has, who think they have to get married at a certain age. Um, yeah, so now these days they are less focused on the marriage and they are more interested in living their lives as individuals. Right, and this change is occurring in North Korea at the moment then? Yes, I think. Right. Soram, you mentioned earlier about your interview with Lindsay Miller, mm -hmm. the wife of a former British diplomat who was stationed in Pyongyang, of mm -hmm. course. Do tell us a bit about her observations mm -hmm. with regard to the lives of North Korean women. Mm. So there are two interesting points. Um, so Lindsay Miller lived in Pyongyang for two years, so she had um, opportunity to talk to North Korean women many times. Um, so based on, con based on the conversation she had with North Korean women, um, the biggest pressure they feel is about dating and getting married. Um, so 
their parents are forcing them to get married. And as I said earlier, their perspectives are changing these days. Um, but then there are still stereotypes among old generation. Um, that's why North Korean women feel pressure about the marriage. Um, the other one is about their appearance. Um, so they have limited freedom about how they look, what they wear. Um, so the reason controls their clothes and their hairstyle and so on. Um, so their left option is the tiny accessories and their shoes. Um, so women in Pyongyang would wear really high heels and like shiny high heels. Um, so shoes are one of the means to express themselves. Right, to kind of like show yourself that yeah, you're in a true. sense mm -hmm. of individual taste with regard to shoes then. So and finally, what are some stories that you plan to follow up on this particular year? Um, so my team, News in Depth team, um, we have another project coming in. Um, we're planning on doing coverage about Korean War. Um, so we like to highlight the tragedy of war following the Ukraine crisis um, in 2020 and through the Korean War in 2050. Um, so we like to examine whether these conflicts could lead to second Korean War. Um, so we also like to examine the impact of Ukraine war on Northeast Asia and Korean Peninsula. So a huge project is coming in, so please tune in up. Right, and what do you hope your readers will learn from the, well, your audience, that is, will gain from your latest coverage with regard to warfare? Mm, so many people in South Korea, uh, they tend to disregard about the importance of, I mean, we live in South Korea, so North Korea is like our daily encounter, but then the Ukraine crisis could lead to another like conflict in Korean Peninsula. So we would like to highlight that importance in raise our awareness region. about yeah. the potential danger, perhaps. Then, mm -hmm. all right, Saram, thank you very much for making the time to join us live, and also do have fun at the award ceremony. I understand it's on the twenty fourth of May over in LA. Oh. Actually, I'm not going there. Reporter no is going there because, like, I have coverage plan in South Korea, so I just couldn't I make it. No, well, that's unfortunate. But still, congratulations Thank on the Gracie you so Award. Much. All right. a remarkable expansion in the industry catering to our furry friends. Services range from hotels to schools to beauty parlors. Our Ideon has the story. Pets are more than just animals. They are companions and even seen as family members by many people in South Korea. As a cat owner, I'm glad that more people are perceiving pets as family members. It's interesting how pet-related services are becoming more diverse. Data released by South Korea's KB Financial Guru Research Institute shows that there were more than 6 million households with a pet in 2020. In line with that trend, the Korea Rural Economic Institute reported that the value of the pet industry was over $2.7 billion in 2020, up 1.1 billion U.S. dollars compared to five years before. It also expected that the market will expand to more than $4.7 billion in 2027. And with this surge, the pet industry is also evolving in many ways as more businesses release products and services targeting pets. 
Hotels and resorts are introducing pet rooms, which allow guests to bring their pets and enjoy vacations with them. One resort even provides a variety of pet services, such as a pet school. With the number of single-person households increasing in South Korea, more pet owners are looking for pet schools where their pets can be looked after when they're not around. By attending pet schools, pets can learn how to socialize with other animals and people while enjoying regular physical activities with professional trainers. Pet beauty shops are also getting a lot of attention from pet owners. Experts carefully examine the animal's skin and fur in order to provide them with the best styling and even spa care services. Some cosmetic companies are also expanding their businesses to pet industry. One company has developed a range of products for pets, including a body mist, a facial mask pack, and even an ear cleaner. We listen to consumers' needs, like what they want for pet products. Our priority is safety, so that's why we focus on ingredients when making beauty products for pets. Dubbed the pet economy, a combination of the word pet and economy, experts say this trend is likely to continue. Pet humanization is a new phenomenon in South Korea. As more people tend to perceive pets as family members, the pet industry is forecasted to develop further. He added more services like nursing homes for pets could be introduced as well as the life expectancy of animals rises. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. As part of efforts to ease pollution, local authorities are actively partaking in recycling campaigns. One such initiative has coffee waste being recycled into furniture. Our Ian Jin tells us how. Like most coffee shops, this cafe in Seoul's Hongdonggu district produces piles of waste coffee grounds. Just at this coffee shop, we're looking at around 200 kilograms per month. It gets collected for recycling. Some 2,000 kilograms of coffee grounds from 25 cafes are collected and taken to this recycling factory where it is transformed into a completely new product. The coffee waste makes up 20% of this plastic synthetic resin mixture. The plastic is used to make furniture which helps lower carbon dioxide emissions. Currently, only used coffee bean waste is being collected, but we're looking to expand so that other disposable waste like cups and straws can be collected together. Here in Gangdonggu district, in front of a local community center, there's a place for ice packs. The used ice packs are collected and disinfected, then made like new and distributed to stores. Only gel-type ice packs that are made with microplastics are reused. Just last year, some 72,000 ice packs were recycled, cutting carbon emissions by 25 tons. We are reusing ice packs and we're also running other environmental campaigns, including turning the ice packs into air fresheners. For stores that have been using more ice packs due to the rise in demand for deliveries and takeout food, this system of reusing ice packs has also been of great financial help. Each of these ice packs costs 16 to 24 U.S. cents. Say we use over 100 a day, that really adds up for us. Individual efforts to protect the environment are growing, but even more awareness and action needs to be taken towards recycling. Such small actions can lead to a bigger change in the future. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Back on Thursday, South Korea celebrated its 100th Children's Day. And to mark the occasion, the Seoul Metropolitan Government is holding a special book program for children at Seoul Plaza in front of City Hall. The program includes storytelling as well as puppet shows. Live music and magic performances are also being hosted at this event, which runs from today, that is Friday, to Saturday. More information is available on the Seoul Metropolitan Library's official website. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Israel's central city of Alad, a fatal attack has seen at least three people killed and two seriously injured on Thursday, as the country celebrated its Independence Day. 
According to witness testimonies, the attackers reportedly used axes. With the perpetrators still at large, Alad's mayor urged residents to stay indoors, while security forces who suspect Palestinian involvement set up roadblocks to catch the attackers. Israel and the West Bank has seen a spate of street attacks in recent weeks, with Palestinian and members of Israel's Arab minority responsible for the deaths of 15 people, including three police officers and a security guard. In New York, hundreds of pro-abortion rights activists gathered in the city's Union Square on Thursday. Mainly comprised of students, the protest formed part of a national walkout organized by the not-for-profit group Rise Up for Abortion Rights. This comes as a verified leaked draft opinion from the U.S. Supreme Court showed that a majority of justices are prepared to overturn the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling that legalized abortion nationwide. Many wore green, symbolizing abortion rights, while brandishing protest signs and chanting. This follows a rally on Tuesday in Lower Manhattan, where thousands of people gathered to protest following the leak. In Iraq, a series of dust storms in the country has resulted in thousands of citizens requiring hospital treatment. Health officials on Thursday said the latest storm in Baghdad saw at least 3,000 people seek medical assistance for breathing problems. The country has experienced an increasing number of dust, sand and windstorms in recent years, including several in recent weeks. Iraq's summers are also getting hotter, hitting record temperatures of at least 52 degrees Celsius over the last two years. Drought is also becoming a problem, with 2020 to 2021's rainy season the second driest in 40 years, according to the United Nations. Elon Musk has secured over 7.14 billion US dollars in funding for his $44 billion takeover of Twitter. According to a US Securities and Exchange Commission filing on Thursday, the Tesla CEO earned financial support from a number of investors, including Oracle founder Larry Ellison and cryptocurrency exchange Binance. Saudi Arabia's Prince Al Walid bin Talal, who initially opposed the buyout, agreed to pitch in $1.9 billion. The filing also showed that Musk's margin loan for the buyout has been reduced from $12.5 billion to $6.25 billion. This speculation, Musk will serve as Twitter's temporary CEO for a few months once the deal closes. The 2022 FIFA World Cup will kick off in just 200 days and the famous World Cup trophy has started touring across Qatar to mark the countdown. The trophy began its five-day journey on Thursday to various tourist hotspots where fans and families can take part in soccer-related activities and snap pictures. Qatar will be the first Muslim state to host the World Cup and for the first time the tournament will be held in the Northern Hemisphere in winter. The Gulf state is also the smallest country to host the event with fans from the 32 competing nations watching games at eight stadiums around the capital Doha. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Friday afternoon. It looks sunny and bright without dust. It's a lovely day to soak in some of that nice seasonal spring sun. However, it will be cloudy at times, bringing some patchy rain to mountainous areas of Jeju and part of central regions. The amount of rainfall will be very small though. And it's rather hot at this moment. Highs are three degrees higher than the normal. So be mindful of high UV index and wide gaps in readings. So factor it in if you're planning outdoor activities, which means you need sun protection and a lightweight jacket for later today. A combination of dry weather and strong wind is increasing the risk of fire on the East Coast. So please do not start a fire in an open place or and refrain from bringing flammable material if you're going to mountains. Hopefully the slight rain activity in the forecast will ease the dry weather. Then temperatures will be a bit cooler. Now let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions.
And that brings us to the end of this week's editions of The Daily Report. We'll be back on Monday. See you then.